Thanks, Robert. That was really wonderful. Um, so I'm supposed to explain my, um, my program first, right? Um, I guess I always have uh, kind of explained it. I, did, I grew up in a family without books. Uh, we, well, there was one book, the King James Bible, and that was it. And, um, but I, I really loved to read from the very beginning. And then um, in the fourth grade, something kind of magical happened. Um, uh, I was, uh, everybody in the, uh, the class was allowed to buy really inexpensively a dictionary. And so I asked my mom, I said, can I have, I think it was like $1.50. Uh, it was a hardback dictionary, and she gave it to me. And um, I just remember holding that book and looking at it. It began with a bomb, and uh, just thinking, now this is rich. You know, I just felt so wealthy. And I knew right then, I, could, I just thought, could, could I ever learn all of these words? And it was just something that, um, that galvanized me. And I think that that's when my uh, life as a poet began. It was, um, it was quite wonderful. And um, then uh, when, I, uh, when I was writing my first book, I wrote a poem that, um, it's kind of an acrostic. It's called an ABC Darian, in which the alphabet is just the first um, letter of every uh, every line starts with a different letter of the alphabet. So the first line starts with an A, second with a B, and on through the alphabet. And I wrote uh, 26 of these poems uh, as the center part, uh, piece of this book, The Alphabet of Desire. And um, I don't know if there's any connection with that, but I remember really just you know loving words, loving letters, and um, and thinking that um, it's a privilege to, I tell my students all the time this, that it's a privilege to write in English because we have such an enormous vocabulary. And uh, the uh, OED, every time they finish a, a one version of it, they're already working on a, uh, another one because uh, we just add so many words to our language every, every day, every minute. So I thought I'd start out with an ABC Darien poem. And, um, uh, this really came from a, a newspaper article as well. I think a lot of poets get their inspiration from the newspaper, the Daily News. I was reading an obituary of Roy Rogers. Now, I'm looking at the audience, and I'm thinking, um, I'm not going to have to explain who Roy Rogers is to about half of you, but the other half probably I am. When I was a girl, he was a big cowboy star on Saturday morning TV. Uh, cartoons were only shown one, uh, one day a week on, on Saturday mornings, and so he had this show, uh, a cowboy show, and he, was, he had a beautiful horse called Trigger, and then his wife at the time, although in the show she wasn't his wife, she was just a sidekick, Dale Evans was his, um, uh, helped him in his murder investigations, not really murder, but crime investigations, and in this obituary, I, um, there was a, a, a line that really disturbed me. And uh, Roy, Roy, Roy was quoted as saying, Trigger, his horse, was the best thing that had ever happened to him. And I thought, okay, Dale was still alive, his wife, you know, how did she feel about this? And so um, my students are always asking me, uh, can I do this, can I do this? And I say, you know, it's poetry. There's no money in it. You can do anything you want. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Uh, and I always use this as an example, too, because the, um, I thought, what if... Uh, why don't I write a poem from Trigger's point of view, trying to explain to Dale what was going on. Let's see, I think, oh, there's, um, I've never been to this museum, but there's a museum in California where Trigger is uh, stuffed. So I've always wanted to see that, but never have. Maybe one day, someday, in my dreams, I can, uh, I can go there. Uh, I, there's another really fun story about this. There's a, a magazine in New York, Parnassus, uh, and the editor, Herb Leibowitz, and I have had uh, an interesting relationship. And um, uh, he's taken many poems of mine, and he took one of these ABC Darians, but he sent this trigger poem back, and he said, Barbara, if you have any thought for your reputation as a poet, you will never, never, never publish this poem. And uh, so... Obviously, I didn't listen to him. Trigger tries to explain. Ah, oh, Dale, he didn't mean it when he said I was the best thing that ever happened to him. If he even said it, chalk it up to the RKO publicity machine. I'm a horse, a dead one at that, mounted in the museum with glass eyes and looking a little ratty as the tubby former fans file by with their bewildered, bored kids who are thinking, 
Golden Palomino, my ass. I can't believe he brought us here instead of Disneyland. The boys looking like overgrown insects and the girls like prostitutes in their halter tops and jean short shorts and platform sandals. It would have killed Roy to see them. Being such a goody-goody, always Leonard Sly just beneath the skin with his Oklahoma homilies, making everyone feel safe and sound. Oh, sure, the big bad Nazis were gone, but there were plenty of villains. On the left, the commies. On the right, the McCarthyites. Poor Dale. You had a horse, too. What was her name? You were queen of the West until you gained 100 pounds on fried rashers, donuts, Wonder Bread, and bakery cakes. Okay, so it couldn't last forever. Get over it, Trigger, I tell myself. Television is fickle. Now it's hospital shows, blood and angst, undercut with tawdry sex. I blame the French. Friggin' cinema verite. Where's the story, the hero, the beautiful girl? Where's the horse? The other dead horses say, whoa, don't get excited, Trigger, nothing's the way it was. That's the truth. Ah, youth. I try not to be bitter, but sometimes I dream about Zorro. Now there was a guy who could make a horse look good. <laughs> I know this is uh, probably a high tone audience and this never happens to you, but um, it happens to me more frequently than I'd like to admit. Um, you know, I'll wake up from, uh, I have a very active dream life, uh, I guess that's my excuse, but I'll wake up from a dream and I've had sex with somebody I'm not even remotely interested in. I mean, it just, you know, changes the way you think about your unconscious mind when you, um, you know, you, everything's in order up there. You think, you know, okay, you know, when you're in your parents' house and they won't let you do something, there's, you know, that's just an anxiety dream. But this is always, like, j disconcerting. And then if you run into the person, it's really uh, a problem because you can't say anything. Although I did make the mistake and tell somebody one time, and, you know, he just looks at me funny every time I see him now. <laughs> So this is um, Ode to Untoward Dreams, and it's part of a big pro I didn't realize at the time, but I started an Ode project as well as an ABC Daring project. I really wanted to write a poem of praise. There are a lot of feel-bad uh, poems uh, being written today, and um, I came to the Ode through Keats and the uh, Chilean poet uh, Pablo Neruda. I like Keats, the music of his lines, but Neruda's praise of ordinary things, and so I think that... Um, I don't know if this is ordinary, but it's my ode to untoward dreams. Have you ever dreamt you had sex with someone you aren't remotely interested in, like one, the guy at work or one of your husband's friends? And the next time you see him at the Xerox machine or a party, you're horribly embarrassed, and the poor guy has no idea what's going on, and neither do you, because you hardly ever see your husband's friends since his wife can't stand you because you are childless, thus selfish, and your conversation is filled with utter drivel like the sex lives of movie stars and all your various fears and phobias, which, since she's a psychologist, she should find at least remotely interesting, but guess what? She doesn't, and she doesn't even know what you and her husband are doing at night. And the guy at work, who could have guessed that he would do those kinds of things and with such abandon? It makes you wonder about his mousy wife and what's going on there, if anything. Freud said all dreams are wish fulfillments, but sometimes it's hard to figure out the exact meaning of your desire. Though in the case of your husband's friend, maybe you identify with his wife because in some ways you hate yourself as much as she seems to, though for completely different reasons, and the guy at work who knows it was probably the enchiladas picante you had for dinner or the four beers, and maybe you are drinking too much these days, though it rarely seems like enough. Your spine crawling up your back, shaking so hard at times you think you either have epilepsy or are on the verge of samadhi. Though neither is your dream come true, nirvana seems boring, and epilepsy, well, who needs more problems? Because when we close our eyes each night, it's review time, familiar but hideous, despite the sexual release with odd partners, and running down a tawdry neon street, you find yourself aloft, soaring over the paltry world so far away it suddenly seems lovely, like an intricate toy town with tiny perfect people doing tiny perfect things, but you always plummet to earth, a hard fall into the amorous arms of the most peculiar people. Yet everyone has his attractions. So when your husband tries to wake you, you say, wait, wait, one more fall, one more kiss. Uh, 
My husband and I teach at uh, Florida State University, and it's a, uh, a wonderful place to teach for many reasons, but one of the best is that um, we have a terrific study abroad program, and uh, everybody, we have a campus in London, which is where everybody wants to go because they can speak English, so the ones in Paris and in, in Florence, Italy, everybody's afraid because, you know, I guess you'll have to speak another language or just smile in another language and, uh, and eat funny foods. So it, it, we're um, always able to go there. And uh, one time we were able to kind of tack a sabbatical uh, four months onto the end of a, um, uh, a summer program there. So we were in Paris um, for six months. And I know nobody's going to feel sorry for me because I had to live in Paris for six months. And don't get me wrong, I had a great time. But at a certain point in the trip, I started really missing English. Now, I got to speak to my husband every day, so it wasn't like I couldn't speak English. But uh, I mi missed really the deep penetration of my own language. You know, just walking down the street and seeing um, newspaper headlines, you know, with, you know, just to know what Britney Spears is doing. You know, it, it's really, you know, you think it's not important until you're coming off and then you realize you know how you know how very important it really is um, and uh, you know I um, I studied Buddhism for a long time and there's a, a, a an idea I guess or a technique or something in Buddhism it's called beginner's mind and uh, I'm a real dunce with languages I really can't learn them so thank goodness David my husband uh, is a, a whiz at languages but one of the things I like about being in a country that um, where I don't speak the language is that finally um, I can have this Zen concept of beginner's mind because I don't know what's going on and it's kind of beautiful in a way because as you grow older you kind of figure things out and you know you have everything well ordered and surprises are harder to come by but when you're in a place where you have no idea what's going on it's really kind of uh, freeing and another thing too that I always find when I'm in another country is here, uh, I wrestle with uh, the national identity. You know, I think, oh, I'm not really American. But boy, when you go to another country, you find out how really American you are. You know, uh, I remember one time I was um, someplace and I heard uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix playing all along the watchtower on a, a, a radio and I started crying. I go, yes, uh, I'm an American too. So, this is um, Ode to American English. I was missing English one day, American really, with its pill-popping Hungarian goulash of everything from Anglo-Saxon to Zulu, because it, British English is not the same if the paperback dictionary I bought at Brentano's on the Avenue de l'Opera is any indication too cultured by half. Oh, the English know their dahlias, but what about doo-wop, donuts, Dick Tracy, Tricky Dick, with their elegant Oxfordian accents? How could they understand my yearning for the hot rod, hot dog, hot flash vocabulary of the U.S. of A., the fragmented fandango of Dagwa's everyday flattening of Mr. Beasley on the sidewalk, fetuses floating on billboards, drive-by monster hip-hop stereos shaking the windows of my dining room like a 7.5 earthquake, Ebonic, Spanglish, you know, used as comma and period, the inability of 90% of the population to get the present perfect. I have went, I have saw, I have took in Jesus into my heart, the battle cry of the Bible Belt, but no one uses the King James anymore, only plain speak versions in which Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead says, dude, wake up. And the L-man bolts up like a B-movie mummy. Whoa, I was toasted. Yes, ma'am, I miss the mongrel of plenitude of American English. It's fall guy, rat terrier, dog pound neologisms, the bomb of it all. The rushing river Jordan backwoods mutability of it. The low rider boombox cruise of it. From New Jersey to Hawaii with its sly dog malasada scarfing beach blanket lingo to the ubiquitous valley girl's like-like stuttering shopaholic rant. I miss its quotidian beauty, its querulous, backbiting, righteous indignation, its preening, rot gut, flag waving cowardice, suffering succotash, sputters Sylvester the cat, siny die, say the pork bellied legislators of the swamps and plains. I miss all those guys, their Tweety Bird resilience, their Doris Day optimism, the candid unguent of utter unhappiness on every channel, the midnight televangelist euphoric stew, 
the junk mail, voicemail vernacular on every boulevard and rue. I miss the Tarzan cry of Johnny Wisemother, Johnny Cash, Johnny Be Good, and the smart talking, gum snapping, hard girl dialogue, finger popping, X rated street talk, sports battle, Cheetos, Cheerios, chili talk, diatribes. Yeah, I miss them all. Sitting here on my sidewalk throne, sipping champagne, verses lined up like hearses, metaphors juking, now zipping in my head like. Corvettes on decks of dream, French verbs slitting my throat, yearning for James Dean to jump my curb. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that when you're traveling? And you just, you just want it so badly, don't you? Just um, I grew up in Hawaii, and uh, coming to the South was really my. Both my parents are Southern, but um, I never really uh, experienced it. Uh, as an, uh, and as an adult, I moved to the South, and I really um, have come to absolutely love um, the South. It's kind of one of the last vestiges uh, or bastions of, uh, of true weirdness uh, in the country, I think. I mean, people tell stories. I was really lucky, too. My sister, after her, her divorce, came to see me, and she married... Um, a man whose family had lived in uh, North Florida for you know as long as anybody could remember, and all of his elderly relatives uh, would I, I got to hear them tell their stories, which were absolutely wonderful. And uh, one of the things that I really like about the South is just how art will pop up in the most unusual places. Uh, I really uh, love uh, folk art. There's a wonderful woman in uh, Tallahassee where I live, Mary Proctor, who um, I bought several of her pieces. She just, uh, she works outside and she, uh, my favorite kinds of uh, pieces that she does, they're kind of sculpture, but they always involve a bicycle tire, uh, but without the inner tube on it, you know, just the, the, the inside of the bicycle tire and chickens. I mean, she's really into it, or at least um, the sculptures I have all have chickens in them. But anyway, she's uh, quite wonderful. And uh, in this poem I'm going to read next, I mentioned two of my favorite folk artists. One is Charlie Lucas, the Tin Man, who makes these uh, huge creatures out of um, discarded uh, farm machinery, really. And um, W.C. Rice, who uh, I was raised uh, in a fundamentalist Christian church, and so it, I find it really scary, um, that, especially the, the fear part of it. And, but my husband, who was raised as a Catholic, it finds it fascinating. And so we found this uh, man, W.C. Rice, who probably wouldn't consider himself an artist. He had created, um, a, a, next to his house, there was a hill, and just filled with crosses and old washing machines with you know, these horrible slogans on them, you know, you, uh, you know, hell, you'll burn in hell forever, and, um, uh, you know, lots of, um, lots of uh, um, not politically correct slogans, too, but it was kind of beautiful in a way. I always get this, these words mixed up, you know, there's the um, cavalry and calvary, and I think it's calvary, right? That's what he was trying to replicate in his backyard, so he's mentioned here, too. But um, really, it's not about that at all. It's, uh, it's my ode to barbecue, because one of the things I really, really love about the South is barbecue. And I've tried to, uh, with, um, I've tried to be a vegetarian uh, off and on in my adult life. And really, the, the reason why I've never been able to be successful is because you know, I always fall to the, uh, the um, Satan of barbecue. Ode to barbecue. We are lost again in the middle of redneck nowhere, which is a hundred times scarier than any other nowhere because everyone has guns. Let me emphasize that plural. Rifles, double barrels, shotguns, 22 semi-automatics, 12 gauge pumps, 357 magnums, and for what? Barbecue. A friend of a friend's student's cousin's aunt's husband was a cook in the army for 30 years, and he has retired to rural Georgia with the sole aim in his artistic soul of creating the best barbecued ribs in the universe, and according to rumor, he has succeeded. Which is not surprising, because this is a part of the world where the artistic soul rises up like a phoenix from the pit of rattlesnake churches and born-again retribution, where Charlie Lucas, the Tin Man, creates dinosaurs giants of rusted steel bands and garbage can mamas with radiator torsos, electric coil hearts, screw fingers. Here, W.C. Rice's cross garden grows out of the southern red clay with rusted Buick shouting, the devil will put your soul in hell, burn it forever, and no water in hell. And I think of Chet Baker singing, let's get lost. 
And I know what he means because more and more I know where I am and I don't like the feeling. And Chet knew about hell and maybe about being saved, something much talked about in the Deep South, being saved and being lost because we are all sinners. Amen. We bear Adam's stain. And the only way to heaven is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, which is kind of what happens when out of the South Georgia woods we see a little shack with smoke pouring from the chimney. Though it's August and steamier than a mild day in hell, we sit at a picnic table and a broad belly band sets down plates of ribs, a small mountain of red meat, so different from Paris, where for my birthday my husband took me to an elegant place where we ate tiny ribs washed down with a sublime Saint Joseph. Oh, don't get me wrong, they were good, but the whole time I was out of sorts, squirming on my perfect chair, disgruntled because I wanted to be a tiny registers, Kojaks, JBs. I wanted ribs all right, but big juicy ribs dripping with sauce. The secret recipe handed down from grandmother to father to son, sauce that could take the paint off a Buick. A hot, sin lacerating concoction of tomatoes, jalapenos, and sugar washed down with iced tea, Coca-Cola beer, because there's no water in hell, and hell is hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll um, end with a uh, poem for my new book, uh, All Night Lingo Tango. It's um, I, I, um, I, another newspaper article I read was uh, about um, uh, uh, the word mambo. And it was um, in this article, it said it was a Bantu word that had come uh, with um, slaves to the Caribbean and had been turned, of course, into the dance, but it means conversation with the gods. And I thought, wow, this is something that uh, I do all the time. I converse with my own personal gods, which I um, don't think of really as like the great monotheist, monotheistic, is that right? Monotheism, monotheistic di uh, deities, but more like the Greek gods, um, you know, prone to backbiting, backstabbing, you know, sexual fiasco. And uh, I wrote about f uh, five or six of them, and I think three of them are in the book. And um, so I wrote one about doubt, one about um, monsters, really, um, and um, one about nostalgia. Uh, uh, I grew up on the island of Oahu, and it's called Oahu Mambo. And this one is really uh, dedicated to the uh, god of the road trip because there's something about being American. You know, when things go wrong, what does everybody think to do? Well, I'm going to get in my car and just drive, and I can find a new life, I can find a better life. So um, this is um, um, dedicated to the road trip. And uh, actually, Travis has uh, made a beautiful uh, broadside of this poem with a, a Cadillac Another place I haven't seen, which is the Cadillac Stonehenge in Texas, in which instead of, uh, uh, there are Cadillacs that are embedded in the earth instead of uh, the, the stones, and so it's uh, in the back. Mambo Cadillac. Drive me to the edge in your Mambo Cadillac. Turn left at the graveyard and gas that baby. The black night ringing with its holy roller scream. I'll clock you on the highway at 3 a.m. Amen. Smack the road as hard as we can. Because I'm going to crack the world in two. Make a hoodoo soup with chicken necks. A gumbo with plutonium roux. A little snack before the dirt and jalapeno stew that will shuck the skin right off your slinky hips. Mr. I'm not stuck in a middle class prison with someone I hate. Sack of blues. Put on your high wire shoes, Mr. Wright, and stick with me. I'm going nowhere fast, the burlesque queen of this dim scene. I want to feel the wind, the glock in my mouth going south down by the riverside shock of the new. Take me to Shingle's fried chicken shack in your mambo Cadillac. I was gone, but I'm back for good this time. I've taken a shine to daylight. Crank up that radio, baby. Put on some dance music and shake your money maker. Rev it up to mock too. I'm talking to you, Mr. Magoo. Sit up and check out that blonde with the leopard print tattoo. Oh, she'll lick the sugar right off your donut and bill you too. Speak French while she do the do. Pick me up tonight in your mambo Cadillac, cause we got a date with the devil. So fill your tank with high octane rhythm and blues, sugar cane and shark bait too. We got miles to cover me and you. Think Chile, Argentina, Peru. 
So take some time off from work because we're going to be gone longer than a week or two. Is this D-Day or Waterloo? White or black, it's up to you. We'll be in Mexico tonight. Pack a razor, pack some glue. Things fall apart off the track, and that's where we'll be baby in our Mambo Cadillac because you're looking for love, but I'm looking for a wreck. Thank you very much.